A half-hour film about the abuse of children in Africa has been watched more than 50 million times on the internet in four days. But the charity that made it is being criticised for its style of campaigning on the issue. What is the role of charities? Have some of them exceeded their limits? And should they freely use the power of social media to shape public opinion around the world? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome, I'm Adrian Finnegan. A US charity's internet campaign to bring accused Ugandan war criminal Joseph Kony to justice has gone viral. On Monday, Invisible Children posted a half-hour film about the rebel leader online, hoping to spark international action. And it's turned Kony into an internet star. In its first four days, the videos had more than 50 million hits on YouTube. At least two and a half million people have liked the charity's Facebook page and almost six million people have tweeted about the campaign using the hashtag Stop Kony. Al Jazeera's Peter Grester has the story from Nairobi. This movie expires on December 31st, 2012, and its only purpose is to stop the rebel group, the LRA, and their leader, Joseph Kony. And I'm about to tell you exactly how we're going to do it. In a flash of glossy filmmaking, Jason Russell has thrust one of the world's most obscure conflicts onto millions of computer screens around the world. Viral videos of wayward celebrities and performing cats are common, but not a film about a bush war in the middle of Africa. For over two decades, Joseph Kony and his Lord's Resistance Army have been attacking villages across northern Uganda and neighboring countries including South Sudan, the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. They've been accused of a host of atrocities, but their infamy comes from their treatment of children, abducting girls as sex slaves, forcing young boys to mutilate and murder their own families, and then fight as soldiers. The video by the charity Invisible Children highlights the atrocities. They posted it on YouTube three days ago. The video took one day to begin spreading and one more to go viral. It's already clocked up tens of millions of hits. This is an impressive piece of filmmaking, but it's also triggered a vigorous online debate about the accuracy of the film. It glosses over a lot of the complexities, for example, in a war full of messy contradictions. And it makes a villain out of one man in a war full of bad people. But there's also been a lot of criticism of the filmmaker himself. Jason Russell is as much a star of the video as the rebel leader Joseph Kony is its villain. But online critics have accused his organization, Invisible Children, of misusing funds and running questionable projects in Africa. In response, Invisible Children posted a robust rebuttal on its website, insisting its money is well spent and its work has integrity. You have had the power of social media basically driving a conversation and forcing people to talk about it. And people have responded to a very well made vid video, you know, so that's what you want. And you want the people at the end of the day, will the people of Uganda be happy that some uh, the world is talking about Joseph Kony and his atrocities? I think they will be. So I think to that extent, it's done the job. Most of the people Joseph Kony's men have brutalized won't know of the extraordinary interest the video has created. But the filmmakers say the point of their work is to have the chief culprit arrested and give his victim some peace. That's much harder than raising a storm on YouTube. Peter Grester, Al Jazeera, Nairobi. It's been over. Well, as the notoriety of invisible children increases by the day, so too does the criticism that the charity is facing. Much of that focuses on what's being called the group's oversimplification of a complex region that's experienced fighting and human rights abuses for over 20 years. Some have criticized the charity's appeal for further U.S. intervention in securing the arrest of Joseph Kony, but this isn't the first time that charities and NGOs have been condemned for calling for international intervention in troubled areas. The Save Darfur campaign called for U.N. intervention in Sudan, yet critics said an intervention would have worsened the crisis. And in Haiti, NGOs and relief agencies were heavily criticized for their own uncoordinated response to the humanitarian crisis following the 2010 earthquake.
So, should charities be allowed to lobby public opinion and impose their vision on decision makers? To help us answer these uh, questions, we're joined by our guests today from Kampala, Jolly Okot, who's the Uganda Country Director for Invisible Children. From London, we're joined by Marika Shomaras, Research Consortium Director of the Justice and Security Research Programme at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And from San Francisco, Gillian York, Director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Welcome to the program, all of you. Gillian York, as a, a social media expert, what do you make of the Coney 2012 campaign, one of the fastest spreading viral videos ever? Well, it's impressive that they managed to spread a video so quickly. Um, it's it's somewhat unprecedented, but I think at the same time, um, you know, I, I'm someone without expertise on this particular conflict, and when I watched it, it was difficult for me to understand uh, what they were doing in terms of trying to r raise awareness, what their agenda was exactly. Is it naive to think that that, that social media and raised uh, awareness, Gillian, can uh, solve the world's problems? Can online activism influence international politics. Online activism can certainly influence international politics, and we've seen that with Haiti, we've seen it with Syria more recently. Um, but at the same time, I do think that it is a bit naive to assume that uh, just by raising awareness, we can solve a problem so complex as this one. Uh, Marika Shomaras, the Kony 2012 campaign is, uh, is certainly um, innovative, it's very slick. What do you make of it? Is it exploiting uh, Uganda's children by manipulating uh, our, the, the viewers' uh, emotions and getting us to, to buy the charity's bracelet? Or do you see nothing wrong with, with calling attention uh, to the fact that an alleged war criminal is still at large? Well, I, I take Julian's point, and I find that very interesting that she said she watched the video and didn't actually understand what the agenda really was. Um, I think that's a really, really crucial point. And I think it's also been very interesting that a lot of people over the last few days have spoken mainly about the phenomenon of the campaign but less so really about what is the content of this campaign, which I also think um, might be a little bit of a premonition of what would be the lasting legacy of this campaign, because once the interest dies down, there won't be really much left of what the campaign wanted to do. What does the campaign want to do? Does it simplify a very complicated story? Well, absolutely. Does it imply that there is an expiration date for solving a really difficult situation, a political situation. Yes, of course it does that, and that is really um, beyond naive. But another point that Julia makes is quite interesting. Yes, can a campaign like this influence international politics? To a certain extent, but I don't think we should assume what's the chicken and what's the egg here, because um, in many ways there's also a, an agenda behind this that supports this kind of campaign. And what the campaign really very, very overtly stresses is this idea of American military intervention in a, in a Central African location with rich resources and with very um, strong geopolitical interests. And it's not necessarily just the case that pressure is being exerted by the video campaign on politicians. I, I'm sure that some politicians um, are very welcoming towards this campaign because it gives them exactly the mandate that they'd hoped for. So you, you suspect that there's a political element uh, to, to all of this? It, it's no coincidence that uh, 2012 also happens to be an election year in the US. No, I, I don't think it takes very much to suspect that there's a political element behind a political campaign, even though the politics and the campaign become a little bit shaded by, by the mechanisms. Um, I think another point that's interesting to really keep in mind is what is this, where is this campaign uh, marketed and who is it targeted at? Invisible Children is very open about this. They say, well, we're marketing this at, you know, at our own constituency. We're not marketing this at anyone else. If you look at the interest in Uganda, and it'd be very interesting to hear what, what Jolly has to say about this, but Uganda's papers today are not half as full of this than, for example, the New York Times is. In fact, the, the government-owned New Vision paper doesn't mention this at all on, uh, under its main stories. And, and the other paper, the Daily Monitor, has a, um, a story about it which is very critical and actually quotes one of the people who has been edited into the film from an interview of many, many years ago. And he actually makes the crucial point in this whole conflict, which he's saying that it's really useless to just focus on the atrocities of one perpetrator in a conflict. The atrocities of the other perpetrator, which is the government army, also needs need to be mentioned. Incidentally, of course, the solution suggested by this video campaign is to support that very government army. And this is where things become really very tricky and potentially very damaging for the future. 
Jolly Ockard, what do you make of, of what you've heard uh, so far and why this issue? Why Joseph Kony 2012 and, and why this year? Why now? Uh, thank you very much um, and uh, I really appreciate the comments that have been given and um, from my side as Jolly, someone who grew up here, someone who grew up in this war, someone who this war started when I was a teenager and now I'm in my 40s and I'm still seeing it happening. As I stand, the reason why it is very important right now for the world to know that Joseph Kony still exists because this war started from Uganda. This war was between President Museveni and, and Joseph Kony. Like it is a war, a conflict that has been complex, a, con a conflict that started way since the colonial time and it has gone this far. But today, as I talk, as someone who represents invisible children and someone who is working as the regional ambassador as well for the areas affected by the war and someone who has been in the peace process, I saw it happen. And someone who has personally even talked to Joseph Cohn on phone, I, I have noticed that this is the time that the world should know that Uganda right now, as I talk, is very peaceful, especially the area where the war started. We don't, the guns are silent. There is peace has gone back to normal. Uh, the, many people who are displaced are no longer in displacement camp. They have gone back home. People have resumed their normal life, apart from the big effect of the war, the, the war that had been going on for more than 20 years that has left behind. But otherwise, military, everyone is peaceful. Okay, but John. when you move outside Uganda and you go to Democratic Republic of Congo, they are still as northern Uganda 10, 15 years ago. And that is why now the world needs to know that this war was a Ugandan war, but now it has moved regional. And that is why now we require more international attention okay. because it's outside the heart. Uganda. All right, Jolly, I have to say that the video doesn't exactly make it that clear. How do you counter the accusation that Invisible Children has uh, manipulated the facts for its own ends, that you, you've simplified the, the issues and ignored uh, the bigger picture, the complex regional politics that are, uh, that are fueling the, the conflict? Why, why focus specifically on, on, on Joseph Konya and not of, of others that are accused of, uh, of atrocities? The Ugandan army. Thank you very much. I think it would, it would have been very easy for us to focus on Uganda army. But right now, as we talk, this war is not in Ugandan soil. This war is Joseph Cohen fighting innocent people who do not understand the politics between Joseph Cohen and President Museveni. And the war right now has moved to Central African Republic. What has Central African Republic have to do with Uganda? What has Democratic Republic of, of Congo have to do with what is in Uganda? And their children are being abducted. Their children are being taken as slaves. And that is where now the world needs to know and the world has to pay attention. And I think it's very clearly stated in the documentary that the war has moved away from Northern Uganda and is now in Central African Republic. In the map, it shows clearly. So that is why now the world need more attention because these people are not able to do anything. They are fighting a war they don't know. And even the world should know that there's only one tribe that is being affected. Okay. That is the Azande right. tribe in Congo, in Sudan, in Central African Republic. Okay. So why then? Gillian York in, in San Francisco. Um, getting back to the, the social media element uh, of this campaign, what are the dangers of slacktivism as, as it's become known? Does it help or, or hinder a, a cause? Does, does helping like or, or, or sharing or, or retweeting retweet, something on, on the basis of very little true knowledge of a subject perhaps uh, absolve a social media user of guilt? Does it in induce a feeling of, well, I've done my bit? Sure. Well, I think, I mean, the, the Save Darfur campaign was a great example of that and one of the earlier examples where uh, people were essentially, you know, first signing petitions, buying bracelets, um, as if somehow simply the world knowing about something would, would solve the problem. Um, and so generally speaking, I would say that, that slacktivism, uh, the best form of slacktivism, really is the idea that one can watch a video from 
from far away from another country, just watch that video and suddenly their awareness will make the situation change. Um, in this case, it's, it's quite clear that something does need to happen. Um, but I think that a lot of the people, uh, including myself, who again, I'm, I'm no expert on this, this particular situation in Uganda, a lot of the people watching this um, might just assume that, okay, if I, if I give to this organization, their, their funds will be well spent and the problem will be solved. Um, when really, I think that there's more going on here in terms of calling for US military intervention, for example. Um, and I don't think that it's clear from the video that the average reader would understand that. Gillian, to what extent is this, this Kony 2012 campaign a, a game changer for uh, the world's charities? Um, does its, uh, its viral success mean that, that charitable bodies and, and NGOs are going to have to overhaul the way in, in which they engage with their donors in, in future? Is it going to uh, impact upon on the ways that they raise funds, do you think? Well, I mean, I think in some cases, yes. I think similar organizations uh, to this one will certainly have to, to uh, take serious stock of how this uh, particular campaign went viral. But at the same time, you know, I don't think that there's any particular formula uh, for determining how a campaign or a video like this could go viral. Uh, this one seems to be rather unexpected. Um, and so other organizations, um, while they should certainly, you know, follow along and, and uh, consider their own methods, um, I, I'm not sure that there's any particular uh, answer to how to replicate something like this. Marika, what are the dangers of, of informing uh, the public about issues uh, via uh, stickly produced internet videos? This, this Konya 2012 uh, video is slick, it's professional, it's a, a fine example of video journalism. Uh, I mean, be, you know, it's very hard to, to find unbiased, balanced news coverage, even on, on mainstream television. It's very hard to convey all of the nuances of, of any subject in a three-minute TV uh, news report. So what's wrong with focusing on, on one particular element of any issue? I think there are two things that are really wrong with it and, and they interconnect. The first one is the, the method, the social media aspect. Um, I, I'm, I'm picking up on Gillian's point. The, this implies that by clicking um, on a link and forwarding something, you have done your share. If this is the future of activism, I'm, I'm really quite worried because I don't know what that would actually mean for, for campaigns in which a mass appeal might actually make sense because they, for example, um, de are dealing with international trade agreements or things like that. Um, so for activism, giving this idea that yes you too can do something by simply clicking on something that's that's quite worrying so that's one very negative consequence the second negative consequence is, is particular to this situation because that that lies in simplification and that lies in the agendas that are behind this um, I think it's it's irresponsible to say the least to give a, a deadline an expiration date to solving a very uh, complex political problem leave aside the fact whether or not solving this problem would mean um, arresting or, or killing Joseph Cohen. But the long-term consequences are completely hidden in this campaign. The long-term consequences being that this campaign supports a US military intervention, a partnering with the Ugandan government, based also on US military interests, because of course the Ugandan government is helping, is helping the US army fighting al-Shabaab in Somalia. And this has long-term consequences for the people living in these areas, because it's the very same army that, um, as, as Jolly rightly said, th you know, they're no longer in Uganda, they're now fighting in Congo, in, in the Central African Republic. There's a slow militarization going on in this entire region. And in the video itself, actually, it's already inbuilt that this might not work. I find this really amazing. There's this, this uh, line where, where the filmmaker says, well, it's been, it's, it would be very difficult because based on this response, the fact that we've already sent 100 military advisors, the attack tactics of the LRA have changed. Well, that's blatantly untrue. The tactics have, have already uh, remained exactly the same. Inbuilt in that is, of course, this idea that this might not work. But um, the, the justification given is not that this doesn't work because it's the wrong approach. So don't blame invisible children if it doesn't work. Um, whereas in reality, it might well be worth thinking about whether the reason why this might not work is because it's the same time, the umpteenth time, that's, that the, the only solution on the table has been to fight violence with more violence and more violence. And if fighting violence with more violence doesn't work, people will say, well, you know, clearly this is because the LRA changed its tactics. It, it defies common sense, but of course, it does have really long lasting implications for people who live in these areas, which are very difficult areas. Jolly Ockert, um, I, I just want to read you um, something from it. A Ugandan uh, blogger that was that was online uh, today. He said that uh, to call the campaign a misrepresentation is an understatement. Its portrayal of alleged crimes in northern Uganda are from a bygone era. 
Uh, he goes on to say that the children in the film are now semi-adults. Many are on the streets unemployed, and the area of Gulu featured in the film has the highest number of child prostitutes in Uganda. How do you respond to that? Uh, thank you very much. You know, it's very easy to, uh, as I say, it's very easy to sit and criticize from a distance. It is true. That is why when you watch this documentary very well, this is something that was advocated for nine years ago. And part of this footage is not what was taken today. But this is something that is showing the world that this is something that has been going on and on and on. And I think, as I said, Northern Uganda is very peaceful right now. But the same challenge that Northern Uganda had 10, 15 years ago is right now what is in the Democratic Republic of Congo and is in Central African Republic as well as the Sudan. And I think uh, from the person who is blogging, who is saying that Guru is full of prostitution, even during the time when the war was there, those were the consequences of uh, the, the war because okay. the children left their homes and came right. and slept on the street okay, and they Jolly. were without their parents. Jolly, how do you, they started developing some of those Jolly, things. Jolly, how do you yeah. answer the criticism that the campaign is, is patronizing and, and reeks of colonialism? Um, I don't I don't know like how true that is because uh, honestly speaking, I am the one who started the forefront of this campaign before the filmmakers even knew about the war in northern Uganda. I started this in 2001 just by myself. Okay. So I, I, I still think that this was a forgotten war. The world didn't know about it at all. At its peak when children are being abducted every day, both sides of LRA and the UPDF, when they were clashing, the civilian population was suffering. No one knew about it. So now that the world is just learning about it today is a little bit rather unfortunate because it has been right. going on for G a half a decade. Okay, you know? Gillian in, in San Francisco, will, will campaigns such as this fade as, as fast as they've, they've emerged? Um, will this campaign have any longevity? Do you think is, is the world of, of social media a fickle place? Um, I think it is. I think it's difficult to say whether this campaign will have any longevity. Um, but I think that the one real lesson here um, is for those of us consumers of these campaigns and of the media, um, I think that we need to become a lot more savvy in uh, looking into and investigating charities for ourselves um, and understanding and learning a bit more about a conflict or a situation before we dive into activism or slacktivism. Marika, do questions need to be asked about the laws under which uh, charities operate? There often seems to be a, a, a very fine line between uh, what constitutes a, a charitable organization and, and, and what is a, a political lobby group. Well, sure, surely those questions need to be asked. I'm not sure whether actually in this particular context that's the most relevant question. Um, I think Invisible Children do exactly what they say, um, what it says on their tin, basically. They do say we are um, an organization that's an activist group and we're using social media. So then to, to then criticize them for doing just that is probably a little bit misplaced. What I think is very valid criticism is the criticism of the content. And I would like to pick up on this point that Jolly has been making, um, that the world needs to know about this. I mean, first of all, it's, it's hardly the case that um, pe people didn't know about this. Um, in the film, there's this really um, amazing quote from the filmmaker who says to his son, who is used to explain this entire conf uh, complex conflict, the problem with Joseph Kony is nobody knows who he is. Well, I, I find that quite amazing since there are really hundreds of people in northern Uganda who have worked for years and years and years with this conflict and who have tried to make it better and who have tried to make peace and so on. I, I assure you they know who Joseph Kony is, so that is simply misplaced. So we, we do have this bigger problem, of course, that the, the idea exists that just somehow by making something better known. And the film is very blatant about this. We want to make him famous. We, we're turning Joseph Kony into a pop art icon, literally. That is sort of the graphics that are being used. There will be a solution. And I would, I would really like to hear from Jolly what, what the steps are that take this from an internet, international uh, internet campaign to a solution. And crucially, I would also like to know well, what happens on January 1st, 2013? Because this campaign, it's very clearly stated, expires on New Year's Eve. So what then happens? What then happens in all the marginalized and underdeveloped and very unsafe areas in the Central African Republic, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan and also Northern Uganda? What happens to marginalized political constituencies? What happens to them? 
unfortunately, Marika and, and Jolly, we, we are going to have to leave that question or those questions for another time. We're, we're, we're out of time here on Inside Story. The news waits for no man. We've, we've got to finish. Uh, I'd like to thank you all anyway uh, for uh, taking part in the programme today in Kampala uh, via Skype. Jolly Grace Ocott in London. Marika Shomarasan in San Francisco. Gillian York. And... Uh, Thank you very much indeed for joining us once again on this edition of Inside Story. Send us your feedback. Uh, you can email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. We'd like to hear from you. Thanks for watching. From me, Adrian Finnegan in Doha. I'll see you again. Bye for now.